Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner, and today I have a special guest, Dr. Paul Hill. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Hill. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be a part of the program. Well, I think it's important to say that today is July 9th, 2020, and uh, you and I are both on the faculty at the University of Tennessee in Memphis, Tennessee, and we are seeing a lot of COVID cases. Uh, in fact, it's increased from the beginning at uh, Regional 1, last count of our 300 beds, 42 of them were COVID positive. So this makes, I think, a, a, it makes it difficult for us to care for the patients and it makes it difficult to uh, work because you have to wear a mask and gown and uh, other protective gear. And it also makes it difficult to go to work because you know you're going to an environment where there's a lot of COVID patients and uh, people die from this disease. So we haven't, of course, we're focused on the medical aspects of treating the patients, hopefully finding a vaccine and whatever we can do to make them comfortable. But there's another aspect to all of this is what are the psychiatric effects? Uh, we don't know that the virus itself causes psychiatric effects, but there's certainly effects of this virus on all of us as a population. And uh, you're in the hallways of the, the hospital seeing these patients. What do you see what do you see happening to patients who already have psychiatric disease? And also, I want you to comment on the effect, uh, you know, on healthcare workers like ourselves. Well, that's a great uh, topic. What, what we know about our psychiatric patients is that they're at much higher risk of acquiring a communicable disease. So we, we know that psychiatric patients um, their judgment may not be as robust as people that are fully aware about what's going on. So those of us that, that don't, that, that are able to focus on taking care of our health, we continue to take care of our health. We understand how this virus is transmitted and we wear our face coverings and we social distance and we wash our hands and so just like other infectious diseases over the last 30 years that I've been involved with, that our psychiatric patients are much more likely to have an exposure. Um, so that's one thing is that uh, uh, the other thing is that when you, when you deal with people that uh, know that there's a frightening disease that's communicable in the com and that Many people have different emotional reactions to this. Some people become very isolated. Some people uh, might um, choose not to socialize and communicate with other people. And that can be a, a reaction to having fear. And we know that our patients that are really dependent upon psychiatrists in the mental health community to help them, we know that they're, that they have restricted access to those services. So the other thing is that when it comes to dealing with medical professionals that are putting themselves in harm's way every day, we know that uh, discouragement and demoralization is a real common problem as the weeks and months uh, move forward. Um, we can all, we're all resilient and we can handle things for days and weeks, but now we're coming up on about four months of this and people are getting pretty tired of this. Uh, and uh, it takes a lot of support from your co-workers. It takes a lot of support from your family. It takes a lot of support from whatever group, social groups you're involved with, whether it's friends, whether it's uh, religious affiliations, whether it's neighborhood associations. 
And the people that are going to do the best with this are people that that even though it's hard to have balance during a time like this, that they continue with as a normal routine as they can. They go to bed at the same time, they get up at the same time, they eat the same kind of foods, they go to they uh, exercise, they communicate even though it's virtually with people that they love and people that they care about. <clears throat> They're uh, not getting too much information about the virus because too much information about the virus can be confusing and it can be frightening and um, and it can be distracting, right? So our number one job is to continue to take care of our sick patients and to take care of ourselves and our family. And uh, so the, the, the problems that we have is, as healthcare professionals are demoralization, discouragement, and we really get exhausted with feeling afraid for a long time is really hard to maintain. I talked to a physician uh, yesterday who's a gastroenterologist in uh, Texas, and his practice is normally procedure oriented. And of course, they, you know, they're still doing them when uh, necessary. But he said, you know, just wearing all the gear uh, is exhausting. And of course, it creates a, uh, a physical barrier, but I would guess it's also a psychological barrier you know, between uh, the, you know, we, we complain about the computer, right, being between us <laughs> and the patient, but you know, now we got a mask covering our face and the patient's got a mask covering their face. And, you know, can they tell if you're smiling? Uh, you know, they can see your eyes. But uh, I think, have you seen any of that in your, you know, interactions with psychiatric patients that the uh, creating a therapeutic alliance is, is more difficult when you have to stay six feet away? Is, is that a real problem or just a hypothetical one? I would, I would say that uh, human communication, we get a lot of information by looking at each other in the face. And I've, I've always been told that I had a very expressive face. And so that's, that's part of the way that I express myself and the people understand what I'm trying to communicate. Um, and so some of that is lost and some of that connection with the patient is lost because, you know, we connect with people through voice inflection, through the expression that we have on our face, through eye contact. And we, we even, even though psychiatrists, we don't touch the patient a lot, touch is involved with connecting with psychiatric patients. And um, we know the six feet dis dif distance really is not a big problem because we usually work across the desk and sometimes we work across the room. Um, of course, we know that telemedicine has been uh, very useful in the practice of psychiatry because we can get a lot of information by looking at someone over the computer and listening to the sound of their speech and listen to the words that they say and look into their body language. But when it comes to face to face with psychiatric patients, uh, I've been I've been in a mask for four months and um, I certainly will. I certainly have to be sure to check with the patients to be sure that they understood what I was saying, not because they didn't couldn't hear the the volume or the tone of my voice, but to, because they couldn't really see the expression on my face. You know, I was giving a little didactic lecture on rounds the other day to the residents, and I was wearing an N95 mask, and I, I happened to go to the washroom, and uh, I saw myself in the mirror. And it's like I couldn't even take myself seriously. You know, it was like here's this guy with, you know, his face covered with this big white thing. And it's like it, it takes some uh, getting getting used to. I think we are getting used to it. Uh, of course, there's a lot of variability in mask wearing. And we're, uh, I know the hospital is trying to uh, 
have a little more uniformity about that so that it's a, a given that everyone is properly protected and protecting each other. Well, what do you, th what do you think about when all this is done? You know, someday uh, it won't be the number one uh, news item. It, I've heard talk of like a PTSD because of this, you know, stressful period that everybody is afraid of, and, and people are getting sick and dying. You know, it's not an abstract concept. Uh, another fellow told me that, you know, this is a war, that more people are dying than Vietnam War. You know, this isn't, this isn't just like the, you know, a passing uh, illness. This is a big deal. Uh, do you see any of that? Um, we haven't, like you said, we haven't seen a lot of that yet um, in the outpatient area. Of course, um, our criteria for PTSD has to do with you develop these, these persistent reliving experiences, bad dreaming, um, fear, avoidance, anxiety. Uh, and we know that you can get this syndrome by you yourself being super sick and almost dying and by someone that you witness getting super sick and dying and somebody in your family getting super sick and dying and so some of it is actual is actual where it's happening to you and some of it is observed right so i mean if your if your mother got sick and really sick and died from this that would be very, it would take you quite a while for those um, thoughts and feelings and images to uh, resolve. So I think what, several things are going to happen, okay? <laughs> so I think that all the patients that have been not able to get treatment during this time of restricted access, I think they're going to return and they're going to be, they're going to be suffering longer and more severe episodes of major depression. They may be other mood disorders like bipolar disorder. They may have weeks or months of symptom being symptomatic with their schizophrenia. They're going to not be having their anxiety disorders treated. And so they're going to they're going to come and they're going to be a little bit behind. Um, we're also going to hear stories about um, people that suffer with mental illness who um, engaged in suicidal or self-injurious behavior. And um, sometime we may learn that somebody tried to get them some help, but there was no psychiatric hospital that had, that was able to accept patients because of the bed limitations. So, so we are, we are going to see people, um, finally getting the treatment that they need, and it's going to be a real wave of, uh, of people wanting help, wanting to get back, wanting help to get back to their normal life. Um, and of course, <clears throat> the, one of my main interests is involved with people that are in remission from their substance use disorder that, you know, that because they're not able to practice their, their normal practices of sobriety and recovery, that they engage in drug use behavior, alcohol use behavior, which reactivates their addiction. And so we're gonna see a lot of people that have relapsed that need to get back into remission and get back into sobriety. I saw a headline about an increase in overdoses. Um, have you seen that? Um, we haven't seen that, but I, we were, I work at a trauma hospital, and um, I, I don't really keep up with the city statistics about uh, opiate overdose death, but th there's a report all over the country that says there is an increase in opiate death, and um, it probably, I believe it has to do with the fact that um, people are unable to access their recovery community. Many times they're unable to go to their um, methadone maintenance clinic. They're unable to go to their Suboxone clinic. And these are drugs that you can't just pick up the phone as a doctor and call these things in. 
And some of some states actually have regulations that you can't prescribe over telemedicine. So uh, if you're an opiate addict and you can't take Suboxone, you're probably going to buy a drug from a drug dealer. But you're not going to know what it is, right? You're not going to know if it, is this really a hydrocodone 10 or is this something else? And of course, fentanyl is in everything. And um, so we, I would, I would think that people are relapsing on their on their street opiates because there's so many rules and regulations around the the opiate maintenance prevention treatments that we have. My, uh, I used to run an epilepsy clinic and I would have patients who had uncontrolled seizures come back very frequently, usually every several months, of course, to refill their medication, see how they're doing, but also to uh, just as kind of a reminder that, hey, I'm here, you're here, this problem isn't going away just because you haven't had a seizure in a few weeks, you know, bring your calendar. And uh, my personal belief and what I've been taught is that that kind of periodic reinforcement really does help uh, people with chronic illness. And uh, I sense that you believe that also for, for patients with psychiatric chronic depression or chronic anxiety, that it is important for them to see their physician regularly, even if you weren't gonna change their medicine that day, just the fact that the visit's coming up that they're thinking about it may improve compliance. Uh, do you do you believe in that sort of uh, approach? <clears throat> yes, I believe that when you have a personal relation, uh, when you have a professional relationship with your doctor, and um, you are having those regular meetings, there's a des designated time and place. I think that's very helpful. Create structure for the patient. And sometimes the patients have problems and they're able to work on them on their own or they're able to report to you uh, when, they, when they come for their appointment. And um, certainly in psychiatry, we know that the connectedness that we have with our patient, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's there's an emotional connection. There probably is a spiritual connection. There probably is a um, interpersonal connection. And we think that's really important when it comes to the therapeutic relationship between you and someone who is suffering with a psychiatric illness or someone that counts on you to give them counsel, uh, guidance, instruction, uh, and helps reinforce those behavioral changes that are important for them to have a happy and fulfilled life. Um, so psychiatry, we play a lot of different roles, right? We're prescribing the pharmaceuticals, we're, <clears throat> we are coaching and we're encouraging and we're nurturing and we're uh, guiding. So we're doing a lot of different things. And if people don't have access to that relationship, they can, they can get off the track pretty quickly. Well, we're running out of time. I, I have one last question. And you, you touched on it earlier, but what can we as uh, healthcare uh, professionals do to do a better job uh, in this environment? Okay, well, I, I would say that, uh, you have to put your uh, mental and physical health care higher on the priority list, okay? So we are all natural caregivers and we care, sometimes we care more about other people than we really care about ourselves. So we need to be mindful that, you know, if I, am, if I, if I get sick, and certainly if I get sick and die, I'm not going to be able to help anybody, okay? So it's an attitude of, self-care. So what does that entail? That, in, that entails eating right, regular sleeping schedule. If you've got a chronic mental health, I'm sorry, if you've got a chronic medical problem or mental health problem, take care of that. Uh, you need to be sure that you've got a, a bedtime and a wake time, that you're eating good, healthy food, and then you're not just picking up something fast and that's fast and easy. 
um, that you're getting adequate light. And of course, I'm a big exercise person. And so you got to keep exercising. And when it comes to dealing with, quote, stress, you brought this up earlier. Um, I'm not so much with with uh, trying to put positive spin on something that's negative. I'm more of a realist and say, you have to acknowledge that this isn't good, but you have to kick in some things that you know work for you. Whatever that is, you might like watching movies and you might like exercise and you might like um, um, a hobby. That's a, that's a great time to do the things that you need to do to balance out the stress that you have. And um, I mean, I guess if you want to make something positive out of this uh, epidemic, you could say, I'm going to take notes during the epidemic and I'm going to write my memoir or something. But um, that's not my style. I'm not really big into writing everything down. But um, I think we can, I think that all the medical professionals and all the mental health professor, professionals uh, that we can somehow steer our way around getting this virus and, um, and also taking care of our medical health and our mental health. And sometimes that's also going to mean doing something that's very hard for all of us. And that is that if somebody's trying to extend you beyond what you can do, then you have to say that really hard word, which is, no, I have another commitment at this time, right? And so, you know, somebody wants to, you to work 60 hours, 80 hours, 100 hours, you need to know what your limit is and be able to say, I have another commitment. That's just too much. Yeah, I'm an, an associate editor for a neurology journal. It's a volunteer position. And it's actually a lot of work. And I just sent them an email uh, yesterday. I said, don't send any more stuff for two months. It's just, it's just too much going on. And as much as I enjoy it, you know, it's like, it's like it's raiding, you know, hailstones. Every time I get another email from them, it's another manuscript to review. So, I, and I felt really bad about it, but it's like, well, we'll just put them on hold for two months and, you know, let's work through this, this two months of uh, difficult stuff and hopefully things will begin to uh, ease up and we'll get back to a reasonable uh, schedule. So, yeah, it is hard to say no. Right. I have a wonderful friend and I learned a wonderful phrase from him. He would say, I'm going to take a step back at this time. And... You know, it it was vague enough, but it was clear enough, and it was concise enough. And like he it. he's a very he's a fabulous person. And I'm glad I learned that phrase from him. Well, Dr. Hill, this has been a pleasure, and it's been instructive. I want to thank you for taking your time uh, to join us here on the Art of Medicine. Thanks very much. Thank you. See you soon.